Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. I am with a real classy guy, a monster musician, and a great anchor on the rhythm section. Today we're with Dave Fowler. He's a, a, a tremendous bass player. And just before I get started on his background, we were talking and Dave's wall is just filled with multi-platinum records that he's played on. I mean, from Dolly Parton, Laurie Morgan. He worked with the Eagles producer, Bill Simsick, and he's got a nice lithograph from Hotel California on there. And he's had a tremendous career, a very successful career for how many years, Dave? 35 35 years, correct. 30, 35 years, and uh, he's a real upstanding guy, good person, and a very good player. Um, primarily, he's a bass player on tour in the studio. He's also worked on production, artist management, and many other independent roles, including running and managing his own band, Uncle Sam, which I got to listen to the tapes. They were badass. They were uh, like, kind of sounded like Van Halen almost in that genre, right, I would say? Uh, thank you, man. We, it, it was a fun time in my life. Originally from North Carolina, he started his career in Nashville in 1985, playing bass for Helen Cornelius, who was the opening act for two years with the Statler Brothers. And then he played with country music les legend Dottie West. From 1986 to 1995, he played bass guitar and served as musical director for country music star Lori Morgan. That's where he got all his multi-platinum records. And he also tour managed the band and crew, which is a lot of extra work. Uh, and as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, you were responsible for, you're basically the, the leader of the team. And then you're responsible for other things like merch and making sure that the venues are properly booked the way you guys want them and riders are adhered to. Is that correct? Yeah, tour manager kind of oversees the entire road operation. You take care of the artist, you collect the money, you make sure the bus driver gets picked up and gets to his hotel so he gets plenty of rest so he can safely get everybody home. And uh, man, you, you just do everything from, like I said, collect the artist's cash to emptying the trash on the bus. Uh, so you do a little bit of everything, man. You, you heard the story about Chuck Berry. Like he used to go in and collect his own cash and get, get yeah you know right isn't that that's pretty wild when you hear that. Uh, yep. From ninety five to ninety seven, Dave played bass guitar and served as musical director for country star Red Atkins. From ninety seven to ninety nine, he composed, arranged, and recorded original songs, and served as record producer for the band I mentioned, Uncle Sam, and all their recording projects. That was Dave's original band. And again, I listened to two of their, uh, I listened to the band, and they are like a cross between Red Hot Chili Peppers and Van Halen. The band made two CDs, one studio, and one live at the Exit in Nash. The Exit Inn in Nashville. And if you can find any of their stuff online, it's definitely worth listening to. Again, it's called Uncle Sam. From 99 to 2005, he played bass guitar on the Rock and Roadhouse tour for country artists Joe Diffie, Mark Chestnut, and Tracy Lawrence. And he also served as studio bassist and record producer for artists John Michael Montgomery, Shelley Rock, excuse me, Shelley Wright, Lori Morgan, Cinderella, Barbara Mandrell, Tribute, and Bill Simsick. From 2005 to 2009, Dave tour managed the band and crew on worldwide tours for country music icon Dolly Parton. And in 2010, Dave got into artist management on an almost full-time basis where he managed the career of country artist Colin Ray, and he helped increase Colin Ray's touring income by 40% in, in 2012, including cultivating relationships with Coca-Cola for in-store appearances with Colin Ray, and he also coordinated television and radio interviews, handling public relations and assisting the booking agent with finding gigs. This is a busy guy, and Dave, I really appreciate you taking time to come, up, come with us on the show today, man. Well, it's my pleasure, man. I've always thought I never think about all this stuff that I've done until somebody reads it back to me. So it's it's kind of overwhelming because I look at all this stuff that you're talking about. and It's like, did I really do that? And I was like, well, yeah, I guess I did. And it, it's overwhelming because, I mean, man, I'm just I'm not any different than anybody else. I'm a I'm a farm boy with a high school education, man. It's like. People think because of maybe some of the things that I've been able or fortunate enough to do, I guess, that I may have some monster education and every ounce of my education is seat of the pants, thrown in the fire, learning how to do it on the job. So I'm grateful to all the artists that permitted me to learn on the job. So 
Yeah. Very cool, man. One, one question before we get started. You you have tour managed in many different situations, I'm noticing, and I would imagine some of the skill sets that you need to do that well are you got to be pretty organized and you have to be pretty disciplined. And I would imagine, though, you have to be like no nonsense about stuff because you can't you know the way people are man you give them an inch and they didn't adhere to this or they didn't adhere to that and then they expect it you know and so you can't really let cut too much wiggle room there within reason is that reasonably accurate that's extremely accurate yeah you have to you have to be on your toes at all times uh and i was uh the tours that i tour managed up until i started tour managing for dolly were not lesser acts, but they were on a much smaller scale. So in order to, um, to do the Dolly thing, man, I was, I was pretty, to tell you the truth, I was intimidated and frightened. Uh, when I took the Dolly gig, I actually called a very dear friend of mine. His name is Mike Amato. Uh, Mike is probably the most sought after tour manager in rock and roll. I mean, he, he did Motley Crue in the day. Wow. Uh, uh, the last time I physically saw Mike, he was out with Kiss, <laughs> taking care of Kiss a couple of years ago. And he gave us all laminated backstage passes and just took care of us, man. Mike's a wonderful dude. And he's the the ultimate example of what a, a real honest to God the head, tour manager is and should be and so I, I love mike we became friends years ago when i met the guys in the in the cinderella camp i met he was with them and we met we became instant friends just a wonderful guy and uh, he's currently out with green day for three years now holy in, crap so he's out he's he's out with the he's always out with the big the big bands and uh because he's so good and uh, but I called Mike. I called him. I was like, Mac. I was like, Mike. Man, I, I got this chance to go out with Dolly. And he goes, Oh, that's that's great, Dave. I says, Well, I don't I don't know if it's great, man. I said, I'm. I've always been a bass player, and I've tour managed smaller scale tours, but this is a pretty big deal, you know, going to Europe with her and all this stuff. Now, I now granted, I have to point out on the Dolly thing. Everything is extremely well run and well done. I had a lot of help. Uh, it wasn't like a, 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 there was a lot of work on me. There was a lot of responsibility. But the thing with Dolly is you always have a wonderful amount of help, uh, both locally and on our staff. We had a tour staff of probably between the band and crew, I don't know, maybe between 20 and 30 people that traveled with us. And then we would have 60 to 80 locals every day. So you're dealing with about a hundred people a day, but everybody has their divisions. Like I took care of the band. I helped with Dolly when necessary, but mainly I had 11 band members that I was responsible for and two tour buses. And, and, uh, so, but I called Mike because I just, I honestly didn't know if I could do it. I wanted to do it because the money was great. Uh, so I called up Mike and he, he was like, he's like, look, dude, he said, how long you been in this business? And I, I said, at that point I've been in it, you know, 20, 25 years. He says, Dave, he says, tour managing, all it is is common sense. And he says, you have common sense. And he said, uh, if you're afraid you're going to forget something, make a checklist, which Danny Nozell, who is Dolly's manager, was a very successful tour manager as well before he became her manager. And he was with, with Slipknot, if you can imagine wrangling those guys for years. Yeah, that's probably a bit of a challenge. And Danny gave me the exact same advice. He said, Dave, if you make a checklist, you'll never forget anything. And so, yeah, that's, that's being a tour manager is a, a tremendous amount of responsibility. And out of that, I got to tour manage for Dr. John and go to Europe uh, with him. And uh, and I grew to love Mac, Dr. John. He's yeah. a great. Uh, and it was uh, they had been through a lot of tour managers when when I came on and, and I uh, he wanted me to stay. But at the time, I just couldn't. Uh, I had some other things going on and. Uh, I had to leave uh, Dr. John, but I still I still love that dude. He's a great guy and just a tremendous artist. 
as we all know. Yeah, for sure, man. Wow, I didn't. You know what? Um, I can't imagine how much work that because I remember when I saw Santana in concert. I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago. And the thing that I was most amazed at is, I'm like, this guy's got to have about twelve. He had twelve people on stage, and I was like, wow, that has got to be managing that. It's just got to be a ton of work. So I mean that's a lot of responsibility when you had when you were doing that managing the you know twelve people of of the band that's a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. You get them into the hotels, you get them out of the hotels. They you, you every day you have to load them up with information for what's going on for the day. Uh, are we traveling that night? How are we getting here? How are we getting there? Making sure we get to the airport. Wrangling you know, uh, freaking. Uh, I, I think we had. Somewhere between 40 and 60 pieces of luggage. I took care of all that. Uh, you know, it's just, it is a lot of work. But it, but once you get in the groove and you get in the grind and you get out there and, and you've done it a couple of days, you just begin to know how your day is going to run. And you know you got to be here. And you know you got to be there. And you know the band has to be here. You know your tour bus has to get there. you got to get your drivers back and forth. You just, once you do it a little bit, it really is just like Mike said. It's it's a common sense thing, man. And you just you just pay attention and and you make sure that you don't forget nothing. You know. Yeah. Well, it's just a lot of moving parts, and it's not like it's a lot of moving parts every day in a different place. That's that's the you know the, what makes it hard. It's not like you know like you're going into work every day and you got a lot of moving parts to manage, but it's in your office or it's in your plant or your you know your farm or whatever it is. You're you're doing it you know location location, which is you know what makes it difficult. I think. Yeah. What, what are you working on now that you're most excited about? Man, I, I'm not working on anything personally musically. Uh, I'm playing in the Artemis Pile Band who is the original drummer from Leonard Skinner. And I really, really enjoy that. Uh, he's really good to me. And, and it's, it's been a real challenge musically because it's such a departure from how I actually approach playing bass. Really? But, in what way? Because th that's probably the songs you grew up. I mean, we're oh. like the same age. So I know you were, you were playing those songs when you were younger. Well, of course, but I wasn't playing them correctly. I was just playing them as I, passingly know. yeah and I, I wasn't really zoned in on the parts but you know leon played with a pick he played up on the neck kind of he didn't and i play very much over the pickups and, and more modern style more modern sound uh i i quit playing fender basses years and years years ago and now i'm back to playing fenders because that's what he favored uh he would play a gibson thunderbird once in a while but i'm mainly playing precision and jazz basses through Ampeg SVTs, and I hadn't done that since I was a kid. So uh, it, it's just a departure from my playing style, uh, but I've adapted uh, uh, as well as I'm able to adapt on it. And, and, and it's just a, uh, uh, you know, it's just, a, uh, it, it's very different. And if you go back and listen to those records, there's, and, and to this day, I've been in the band now probably eight or nine months. And every time I go back and listen to an original version of any of the songs, including of the all things Sweet Home Alabama, that's probably the thing I played the least correctly. Interesting. Because, yeah, it is, man. And if you go back and listen to those records and really zone in on the bass parts, uh, that's what you find. So it's it's but it's been good for me because that shoved me really outside my comfort zone as a bass player, you know. And it, so it, I would say overall, it's it's helped me. You know, are the the guy the other guys in the band are they like in the same situation? Were they finding the same thing that you know? Gee, I, I I played these songs growing up, but maybe I didn't play them correct. There's yeah, that without question. Yeah. All, all all three of the other guys, the two guitar players, and man, they have they have. If you come, if you ever get a chance to see us, you will see they have they have put painful hours in on all those guitar parts to play them correctly. We all try to play the same instruments, not necessarily the same amplifiers, but we try to play the same instruments um, that they used on the records to get the sounds. We really strive to get the sounds correct so that it's authentic. 
And, and, and playing with Artemis has taught me how much he defined the sound of Leonard Skinner. You wouldn't think a drummer would, 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 would define a band the way that he defined that band, but he really did, man. And, and if you come see us live, you, you would, the lights would go off and you would get for sure. Uh, you, you would understand what I'm saying and you would only understand what I'm saying if you did see us live, because you just don't, I, I don't, I never thought about those parts and the drum parts and how he approached everything. But now after playing with him and playing these classic songs, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a real treat and a real trip because he's he really did define a great deal of that sound. And, you know, it's it's surreal some nights because I'm playing, you know, Saturday Night Special or yeah. I Ain't the One. All those great classic songs. And I'm like, I'm just kind of look around like, wow, I bought this record when I was a kid. You know? <laughs> the record, right. The actual record. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. You, you know, there's so, a lot yeah. of, uh, and I'm sure you know this, Skinner had a lot of slower ballads, you know, stuff like Curtis Lowe that were really, really good songs that they never, they were sort of like minor, you know, they weren't like A hits, but I don't know why they should have been. There was a lot of them too. There wasn't just one or two. Well, it's, um, I have come to realize and I always knew it, but I never defined it in my, in my own mind. I've come to realize that Leonard Skinner music is part it is a great part of the thread uh, uh, of American culture. Uh, when, when, when we go play and the fans come out, man, and that music will never die. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's only two guys left. You know, there's Artemis and Gary Rosington. And unfortunately, Gary is not in great health, you know, uh, and we're really pulling for him to, uh, to be okay. Uh, Ed King is left, but Ed has had a heart transplant. He lives here in Nashville, so he's not wow. able to. I didn't realize he. Do, I didn't know yet. Wow, that's terrible. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, he was really prolific on. He's on online. He was a lot. Now that you mentioned, I haven't seen or heard much of him in a little while. He's around, and he's he's a he's a good guy. He's I met him once over at uh, Glazer Guitars. One day I had my little boy with me and he had his dogs with him and my little boy was playing with his dogs and he was very nice. Uh, he's an eccentric guy from what I understand. And, uh, I, you know, uh, but he's, boy, he was very instrumental in that band. Yeah. He, I have isolated bass track of simple man that he played on and it's, you would be amazed at, at the bass line throughout simple man. You know, he, he had a lot of stuff he was doing that's just, it was out of this world great. So, you know, I always, every time I play I play the song, you know, live, I, I, I can't help but think of Ed, you know, because sure. he created it. And if you get a chance, look up the isolated bass track to Simple Man. You yeah, will I'm gonna be making a note here, actually. Yeah, you'll be, you'll be astounded at it when you go back and listen to it. The tone, the delivery, the choice of notes. Uh, you know, he, he played chords over the entire guitar solo. Never really thought about it until I started really learning it correctly. Yeah, it's it was incredible, man. It was just an incredible band, and I'm I'm really proud to be a part of that. And I love Artemis, and I'm playing with him. And then I play with a, a Nashville artist named T. Graham Brown, who leans to the very R&B side of of country. Uh, boy, he's just a monster singer monster singer so i'm doing those two things now and i enjoy both of them musically and they both pay decent but it doesn't take me away from my family all the time you know it's mostly weekend warrior stuff uh, with an occasional weekend off so it, it suits 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 us fine so are you doing stuff in the studio for t grant brown as well or, or just tour stuff for right now just tour stuff yeah we we're talking about working on a new artemis pile band record uh but we haven't, and I'm sure that we probably will, uh, but it's just getting the timing for everybody. You know, everybody in the Artemis band are, are wonderful musicians, but they're also very, uh, it, it's an odd situation because our guitar players are Scott Raines uh, and Jerry Lida, uh, who are both very successful business guys. They just happen to be really great musicians, and we've all known each other since we were kids. It's how I got in the band. 
I grew up in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, that's where they're based because Artemis lives over there. And uh, Jerry had been talking to me about, you know, if, if their current base player left, would I consider coming to play with him? I said, well, you know, I, I'd love to, but I'm in Nashville. And, you know, it would just depend on logistics and timing and my schedule. And it just finally lined up. It finally lined up. He hit me at the right time. Their bass player had taken a gig with the Marshall Tucker Band. Uh, they needed a bass player. And um, Robert Kearns was doing it for a while, who's my very dear friend, who is in a, a killer band called Cry of Love with uh, guitar player Oddly Freed. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I know him, because he, he did a lot of dates with Government Mule, with Warren. Correct. Yeah, yeah, I know him. Yeah. Uh, Robert was in Cry of Love, and he currently tours with Sheryl Crow, uh, and he was doing it for a while, and he was actually in Skinnerd for a season. Okay. Robert was. Uh, Robert's one of my dearest friends, and boy, he is a... <laughs> He's a ridiculously fantastic bass player, but he couldn't commit, obviously, to Artemis because he was doing the Cheryl thing. And then our other buddy, Johnny Jump, who's also from Asheville, but lives here in Nashville as well. Between the three of us, we were bouncing the gig back and forth. Um, and finally, my schedule just got in the right positioning at the right time. And uh, Jerry talked to me about being in the band and I said, well, I would love to. And so we did new band photos and, and promo posters and, and we're off and running. So I've been in the band now officially for probably about, about eight months, maybe. That's so awesome, it's uh, been great. Yeah. That's so awesome. just, I enjoy it. Well, congratulations, man. I'm happy. It sounds like a really nice gig for you. It's a lot of fun, man. It really is. Well, it's and challenging my, too, which is nice. It, it, it is. And at my age, man, uh, I enjoy the challenge, but I really dig the fun. You know? <laughs> I hear you, man. Hey, another subject for another day, but I, how about Asheville, North Carolina? That's probably night and day from when you grew up. Uh, right? I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even want to live there now. <laughs> I mean, I, I would because it's, it's a beautiful place. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, it's a stunning, beautiful place. And I still have family there. You know, I have two sisters over there, and my mom and dad are still married. They've been married 53 or 54 years uh, next in November. Oh, your mom so, and dad, really? Congratulations. That's awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah. Um, you don't hear that and, very much. No, nah, not much anymore, man. But, uh, yeah, they're uh, uh, they're doing okay. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I just I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to live over there now. I don't. <laughs> after uh, after our interview, I'll tell you a story about Asheville. Uh, right. So uh, let's, let's talk about Bill Simsic. Uh, now, you, I know you've done work with him, and he's a guy who produced all those classic Eagles, Joe Walsh, and Gang, James Gang albums, correct? Oh, yeah. Frankenstein, Edgar Winter, man. He, he, you know, I fooled around, fell in love, Elvin Bishop. I think he he did that record. He, he I, I can't even remember all the stuff he's done. His his track record is tremendous, and I only I got to know Bill. Let me back up and tell you how I met Bill. Yeah, that'd be great. Years ago, uh, I used to do my own children's charity back home. I, I I just wanted to do something to give back to to kids back home in in Carolina. So I would. During the year, I would collect, you know, when we would gig with other big artists, I would get, uh, you know, autographed T-shirts or pictures or hats or whatever I, whatever they were willing to give me. And I would stockpile it all and take it home and do a, 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 an auction, if you will, you know, to raise money and give all the money to charity. Well, I've been doing this for a few years. Bill and his wife, Lisey, just wonderful, wonderful people, man, uh, had – gotten wind of it one year and they wanted to attend so he came out and he brought me one of his platinum records of hotel california wow to auction what a so, cool dude yeah and he, and he told wow. me he says he wow. me to the side he goes dave look he goes if if you don't get at least a hundred bucks for it he goes i'll give you the hundred bucks and keep the record i said fair enough bill uh and then bucks. after you got to get a lot more than a hundred bucks for that i bet at that time, this was in the, man, this was in, oh my gosh, this would have been very late 80s or early 90s, probably. When 100 anyway, bucks was like 1000 bucks today. 
Yeah, yeah, it was a little more than it would be today. Uh, but uh, so anyway, they uh, after the event, we were talking and he said, you know, he said, Lucy and I want to get involved in this, Dave. He says, uh, let's talk. So he gave me his phone number and we just became friends and we did a couple of fundraisers together, uh, which, you know, he brought a lot to the table, obviously. And uh, and uh, just great people. And then. You know, as we got to know each other, then I only worked with Bill one time uh, on my resume. It probably sounds like I worked with him more than once. But he had gotten a call from Nashville uh, from a major label. They had three guys they were interested in, but none of them were probably strong enough as an artist to make it. But they felt that if they put the three of them together, they could be like the new country eagles or something. Okay. So to speak, you know. So uh, I, I believe it was a story, and I'm telling the story as I, as I can remember it and as best I, I, I hope that I'm being pretty accurate because this was a long time ago. So anyway, um, 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 he hired me. They hired him to, do, to produce this project. Bill said, I'll only do it if I get to go do it my way. I don't want anybody standing over me, you know, and obviously who's not going to let him do it his way. Look yeah. at his success, yeah, yeah. you know? Uh, so obviously they uh, were happy to oblige him and his request. Is that, let me uh, interrupt you just for one second. I'm sorry. Is that a realist? Like would a label hire a guy like a bill and then say, okay, we'll tell you what to, it seems like we're like st- kind of like ne- negating the whole point of bringing a guy like that in they do it though, man. They, wow. They do it. Okay. They just, I mean, they they would do it. Yeah. I mean, it's like the label. I don't. I don't know if you ever heard the story, but the label actually rode Mutt Lang pretty hard on the first Shania record. You're you know, from kidding. What I, uh, they rode him pretty hard, man, and he finally just got really aggravated and just, you know, a guy like, with that he, track he, record. <laughs> flat out told him, "I'm doing this my way. It's why you hired me." back off uh you know and i don't know how, how much of that's valid sure you know but i got a feeling uh, knowing nashville the way i know it probably yeah wow. uh, but they let bill go do it his way and you know in his home he had all that old bay shore recording gear dude that he made all those records on so we got over there and uh joe vitale played drums you know, Joe was, uh, he's legendary. He played on Rocky Mountain Way, Walsh, and and he played all the keyboard parts on that record. And I've been a Joe Vitale fan, so it's kind of really wild for me because I'm sitting there right beside Joe Vitale and Simzix in the control. <laughs> you know, and these other guys that were the, the singers um, uh, uh, were uh, the guitar players as well. So they played guitar parts and stuff. So at any rate, uh, we got in there and we got to work and, you know, Bill just does what he does, man. And he, he would just have us do, <clears throat> he would, uh, we would do like, I don't know, man, three, between three and five complete takes of every song. And he would just tell us, he'd say, okay, boys, he would be like, play really conservative, just play conservative. So we would do a full track of that. And then he would say, okay, give me a little more. Don't get too outside. Play sort of conservative, but add things as you feel that might be tasteful. Then we'd do that. And then he would say, go crazy. Play whatever you want, as much as you want. And then, you know, and and then he would just reel it in and he would cast it out, reel it in, cast it out, reel it in until he felt like he got what he wanted. And then, you know, he's an old school two inch tape splice guy. And that's how he made all those records, man. It was really amazing to sit and watch him work because he would just, and he would take the big two inch reels, you know, and just pull it and it would just spin and, <laughs> and then he'd take a razor blade and hack it. You'll be going, Dang, how does he, know, how does he know what he's, you know, he just, he's running what we just did. But, you know, it, it was really interesting. There's not, there's probably not a handful of those cats left, man, that, that, and, and people wonder why they don't have any bands that, that last like that anymore, because they don't take the time to do it. It's, 
And, and man, and I love Nashville. I don't want to crap talk Nashville, but it's all about how quick you can get it done and how fast they can get it to market to see if it will stick. Or if it doesn't stick, they're right on to the next thing. And I think, not to get off into all that, I know it's helped some people, but these TV shows, man, like The Voice and frickin' American Idol, uh, they've just made a mockery of our industry to me. And that's only my opinion. That doesn't mean it's true, and I don't want any hate mail over it, but, man, it, there is no such thing as instant success, you know? Well, you know, I've heard... What... Here's the, the clincher. Let me say this. Yeah, quick. yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, if I, no. I, if I don't say it when it's on my mind, I'll forget it. That's uh, why we're here, man. Uh, Let's go. But, uh, the uh, uh, Here's the clincher for that. I bet, I bet there... It, without looking it up, neither you, me, or anybody that's going to be listening today can tell you the last four or five winners on any of those TV shows. That's the problem. Unless you they know, know them because they're like, a, you know, someone who's like, a, you know, there are people that are just obsessed with these shows. But from a musical standpoint of, oh, yeah, this one I know because they had this hit. And yes, I would agree with that 110 percent, man. Yeah, you know, I, I spoke with, do you know Jerry McPherson? I don't know who Jerry is, most certainly, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he said the same thing pretty much. I mean, he said that, uh, you know, the speed with which stuff gets done is just, you know, it's ridiculous. And he said the attention span nowadays, he said, you know, like I'm the kind of guy I don't stream music, which is like very ancient, I know, but I look at my relationship with musicians differently. I want to listen to something and like I want to find something on the album. I'm I'm willing to give a new person I've never heard an album's worth of my time. But he said that's a rarity. He said now, you know, you got a single and you don't even get the single, man. If you don't get to the punchline like pretty darn quickly when you first start, you're done. It's it's hopeless. So that's a yeah. So my point is, whatever you're saying, I've heard validated by other guys that are in sort of like our age range who who have a history of seeing it quote the old way and the new way. Yeah, uh, that, that's it, man. Yeah. What did you learn most from working with Bill musically or business wise? Uh, how important it is to take your time when you're when you're creating art, uh, the care that he takes and the pride he takes in his work, uh, something that probably without a doubt rubbed off on me. Do I have that luxury? No, I don't. I don't have that luxury when I get to uh, uh, make a record myself because I produce too, and I and I have to you know because of limited budget. Uh, I don't get to I don't have the luxury of taking all the time. I do take probably more time than than most guys. Uh, for instance, like when I track a record or even just a two or three song session. And if I'm producing, I go back at the end of the session and I keep the drummer over with me and we pull up nothing but bass and drums on every track and we scope every freaking note. Uh, every nuance we go back and there's no vocals, no guitars, no, no, there's bass and drums. And that's all we listen to through the loudspeakers as loud as we can get it so that we really pick apart. And if he and I are together and we're happy with what we've done uh, and we don't have to fix anything, then we move on to adding things. And that's how I like to make records. I, it's not near as, as thorough and as good as a guy like Bill, but it's, uh, but at least I, I, I want to do my clients right, you know. So, I want to give them the best product I can. So in, in, from your perspective, you do that because I'm assuming the foundation is the rhythm section. So you're building, you know, like the, the bedrock. You want to get that foundation done first. If that's not happening, it doesn't matter what else you're putting on top of it. Is that your thoughts? That's yeah. exactly right. Interesting. It's solid there, and it's, then you're good to go to start building the house. When, when Bill does that, where he'll tell you, okay, play conservative, then you know, add a little bit, and then go nuts. Does he then combine different parts of that together? Like, will he say, okay, well, I like how Dave 
played the bass on the go nuts part, but man, I really like the guitar player's part better on the conservative. Does he combine them or how does that, how does that work? I, I just, I don't know that process. It's like a very crude version of pro tools. He just would cut, <laughs> he, he would cut the tape and put them all, put a, put together a performance. Literally. I mean, wow. yeah, I mean, he would, he can take parts and, Except he did it on two inch tape. Now, how he did that, I have no idea, That's dude. Nuts, man. <laughs> uh, and and it's his way. You know, it's 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 what he does. And he's just an amazing dude, man. I mean, I, I mean, and and and, and obviously, I mean, just go back and pull up his discography. Look at all the stuff he's worked on, and pick any one record and listen to it. Listen how great it is, and how great it still sounds today. And and how relevant that music still is on the radio. Yeah, man, that's a big thing, relevancy. Yeah, very big. I can't think of anybody beyond he and Mutt Lang who've, who've really probably done that much. Well, know? Tom Dow, but it was in a smaller niche. You know, he did, you know, true. smaller niche, but super talented guy. Um, I don't even know if this is a valid question or if it's explainable or at all, but what does he do in the studio with his artists, his musicians to get these types of performances out of them that other guys you've worked with don't do, don't know about or aren't qualified or don't have the skill sets to do. Well, number one, I, I think when, when any musician, no matter if it's, it's me or if it's a, you know, Nathan East or, or whoever he would hire, number one, you're going in with a, a, a level of, of respect for the man you're working for. Uh, and you're going to want to give him your best, number one. So I think that from the onset of being hired by him, you, you really want to go in and try to give him exactly what he wants and you're going to strive to do your best for him. So I, I think that's just a mental uh, uh, mindset that you go in with to start with. So that helps being yeah. motivated area. So, but I think what I already covered that, I, I think it's because he allows you a lot of freedom. Uh, he wants conservative performances, then he wants a little more, then he wants an all out crazy performance. And I think giving, giving musicians creative freedom it's when they really can shine and do what they do, you know. And these guys in Nashville, you know, and at the same time, the guys that make records every day in Nashville, uh, those guys are good, man. That's why they can get it done. I, I'm not that guy. I'm nowhere uh, near as good as the, the cats that do it every day. But if, if you give me time and, and you're patient and you really relay to me what you want, I will get you a great track. But I'm not that I'm not that Michael Rhodes or the Glenn Moore for the Mike Brigner Dello or the Gary Lund that can <clears throat> go in there and two takes and have it just picture perfect and dead on and play everything in between. And those guys do it every day. And they're I, I don't I do not want to discount the importance or, or the expertise at which they can do their jobs because they're freaking good, man. There's a reason that they do it every day. And, and there's a reason that they're good at it. And, 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 and I like those guys. They're all my friends. Um, I will always argue the point that uh, I love the way Bill makes records, but Bill requires a lot of time, which in turn is a lot of money, which the labels just don't want to spend now. Yeah. Uh, but it's all relevant to sales and, and how the business is. The business is so turned. It's just so – it's just a different ball game now, man. Yeah. What did you learn most from working with Dolly Parton? Be on time. <laughs> That's her big thing? Be on time. <laughs> Don't be late. Be on time. If you're five minutes early, you're late. Yeah, I hear that, man. So she's a real no. stickler for time. Buddy, there's a reason that woman's worth almost a billion dollars. Uh, here and it's her work ethic and being on time. You won't be you won't be late more than probably a couple of times. You won't have a job. Yeah, yeah. And she's sweet as she can be, and 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 you know. And I wasn't. Uh, people think because I worked with her, I was you know hangout buddies and stuff. But that's not the case. When you're on tour with her, she's doing her thing. She has her personal assistant. 
and her security guy that she's closer with. And of course, Danny, her manager, uh, uh, travels as part of the entourage. So they really deal with her. I dealt with the band and then I would assist, um, uh, her at her tour manager for since like 72, when she left the Porter Wagner show was a guy named Don Warden. Uh, Don passed away several months ago. Yeah. Just a a wonderful man. Just, Oh, so, I got to, after we got the band on stage and we got the shows going, Don would always come get me and he would say, hey man, he goes, help, help me get some, uh, some ice for Dolly's bus. Because up until that point, she was still on her old tour, but she would not buy a new one, dude, because it was set up like home. She didn't even have a refrigerator. We had to keep fresh ice on there for her. Oh, wow. Uh, she, dude, she just, she's very mom and pop very old school and that's the way she likes it you know and and you know what how are you going to argue with a lady that's done what she's done and worth what she's worth right and she's earned every dime of it yeah believe me she yeah. really has she's a pretty hard worker there's a reason she is as is as successful as she is and and i just love her to no end and i don't even I mean, I worked for her. She knows me. She would know me if I walked in a room. But, uh, you know, we're not big hangout buddies, you know. And uh, and she was sweet to me, always good to me. And I'm grateful for every penny that woman ever paid me. Wow. You know, but be on time. <laughs> good lesson, then. Hey, uh, yeah. if you could give me the pluses and minuses of each of the following things that I that I rattle off, that'd be, I'd be interested in that because you've done so much. Uh, playing bass on tour. Man, there are no minuses there. You know, that, that's all pluses, man. Uh, getting to do, getting to do something I love so much, and and get paid to do it, and get, you know, uh, there's uh, that's all pluses. I can't think of a single minus on that. You know, the guys that have been most successful that I've interviewed, that is literally one, not ninety percent, not ninety five, but one hundred percent is that pretty much that answer. Of you know that I'm getting paid to do this, you know how can I not be just thrilled? So that's a real consistent answer. Playing bass in the studio, pluses and minuses. Mm. Again, I don't think there'd be very many minuses. <clears throat> the uh, the thing you have to be more conscious of probably is you got to play real clean got to be really right on the money you know there's no you can't you know have a sometimes have an issue with latency so <laughs> uh so i have to really keep myself in check uh but again man you know you when i'm in the studio i'm getting paid to to play my instrument and 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 play on a record that hopefully at some point will see the light of day and and uh that's all good stuff to me, you know. When you said issues with latency, what does that mean? Sorry. Oh, just late notes. <laughs> gotcha. Being behind the kick drum. I got gotcha. Usually never. I'm always behind. But, but uh, yeah, you know. Having your own band, pluses and minuses. Lots of work, man. The, the minuses of that is just, just a lot of work. I've always been the kind of person that would step up. If nobody else was going to step up to lead, I would be that guy. So I, while I like that, you, you take on all the responsibility of coordinating rehearsals and booking studio time. And, you know, uh, that part of it is, uh, you, you know, by the time I sit down to play my bass, I'm usually pretty tired. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> but, but it's at the same time very rewarding because you're getting to play your own music on your own terms and you don't have somebody turning around going, turn down or play this or do that. You just kind of do what you want to do hmm. and, and what you like to do. So that's, yeah, that's pretty simple, you know. Pluses and minuses of managing other bands and crews. Mm, that would probably almost be the same answer. It's just problematic. It's problematic often that, you, you know, you get stragglers or you get guys who just don't know what to do and you're constantly having to take time to, 
you know, to oversee, you know, it, you know, but at the same time, you get to be a leader, you get to step in there and, and make sure the job gets done, make sure your artist is happy. And that's all rewarding in here, you know, sure. In your heart, I'm pointing to it's 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 a very rewarding when your artist shows up and everything's running smooth as silk, and and but that isn't because as a direct reflection of necessarily you, it's the the job you've done through everyone else, uh, so it's everyone contributing daily, uh, you know because it takes a team. There's no one guy that can do everything, man. It takes a little bit of everybody pulling together, doing what they're supposed to do to make it all work. And then lastly, producing pluses and minuses. Oh, uh, there again, I can't think of a single minus on that. It requires more of your time and you got to really try to pay attention to details. You not only have to listen to the parts you're, if I'm playing and producing, which is usually the case, I almost always have to go back and do my bass track because I'm trying to pay attention to what everybody else is doing to make sure we're getting uh, the right things to make my client happy and, and to make the best record we can make. So that's probably the, the best answer I can give on that. There's not a lot of minuses other than having to listen to everything while you're trying to do your parts too. Uh, but it's not too often I hire a bass player because I don't, I have a very specific idea usually of what, what, what I would do. And I have a really difficult time trying not to coach guys. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I'd, I'd rather do what I'm thinking I'm hearing and here that will be good for the song than try to tell some other guy how to play the part. Cause I don't, I don't like being that guy anyway. I like hiring musicians because they do what they do. And that's why I hope people hire me. Sure. I, I hire me because Dave maybe brings something different to the table, you know? And, and we want him for what he does. And that's the reason a musician should get hired, in my opinion. Do you find when you're producing your own stuff, you have to really be mindful of, like, being too hard on yourself? Like, like sometimes, you know, the ex I have an expression, a lot of people, you know, done is better than perfect. You know who's a great example of that is Led Zeppelin. They knew when to quit messing with it. Yeah, man. That's that's a was yeah. always and always perfect but man when you put that record on even today yeah you know how great it is yeah you know and uh, a lot of those old records are that way you know i don't know if you've ever noticed this brings up something that i think of all the time yeah i uh, remember the song maggie may by rod stewart oh, i love that song great song Boy, it opens up with the mandolin well listen to this here's something you're not gonna yeah man you've never noticed everybody listening Go pull that today and listen to it and listen to all the bass mistakes. It's full really? of bass mistakes. Ronnie Wood played bass on that. And it is, it is, but it felt, it feels that you've never noticed it because the track feels good. It's a fantastic it's a song. song. It's a beautiful it's, song. It's, that's a landmark bass. cultural song. But there's bass mistakes galore. He's missing notes and he's not getting the chords in time. It's all, dude, you're going to be amazed when you go listen to it. You're going to email me and go, Dave, I listened to Maggie May today and guess what? You're right. <laughs> well, man, his rhythm guitar playing with the Stones is no different for, for the last 25 years, right? So it's the same stuff. Yeah, I love that song. But it's funny, you, you mentioned like the other day I, I was in the gym and, uh, you know, I had my, my headphones on and, um, you know, that song when the levee breaks by Led Zeppelin it opens up with this Bonham just who's probably one of the most powerful hitters you know ever and I listened to that and I said man you'll never ever hear anything like that again and that was their first album that was on yeah. their first album it was on Led Zeppelin 1 and I was like holy crap how does how does their band come how did you know that's almost a miracle that's like you know Right. That's my ringtone. Yeah, you, you don't you don't hear that, man. Who thunders on? I mean, that was just phenomenal. But yeah, you bring up a good point with all the mistakes. I mean, Page is is well known for you know for making mistakes. But you're right. They they knew. So when you're in the when you're in the studio and you're producing yourself, do you are you know how do you guard against? 
you know, being over careful and, and get, I, I, I just, man, I'll, I'll go back and if I have a questionable part, I will, <clears throat> excuse me, I will either get the engineer's thoughts or the drummer's thoughts because we're usually the three guys left. I'll just say, Hey guys, does that bother you? Like it bothers me. Did I, did I not get there in time or did I, is that lick, is that going to be too much in that spot? I get another opinion. Okay. And if they say, oh, man, it sounds good to me. Or, or, and, and, and usually they're pretty honest with me. I say, Oh, you, you could, yeah, do something else right there. Try this. So, but at that point, I just, I have learned over the years. I mean, I could stay in there 24 hours a day trying to tweak parts, but sure. at some point, at some point, like all those other guys, you just got to learn to quit messing with it and let it be what it is. And, and, uh, as long as it's not too out of context or too sloppy, I, I tend to leave stuff, you know? Just made a note, man. I'm going to put that opening of that track as a ringtone for me, too. I like it. That's a good idea. <laughs> um, you grew up in Asheville. What kind of childhood did you have? You said you grew up on a farm. You were pretty rural. We, we, we lived outside. I wouldn't say we lived on a farm farm, but we lived on a, a, a nice area. Uh, we were uh, caretakers. My dad is a blue-collar worker. We were caretakers for some folks who uh, came to – Carolina in the summers and spent uh, their winters in Florida. Very nice older couple. And uh, uh, we were caretakers of their place. So it was a lot of land and, and, a, and a lake that we got to fish in. And yeah, I mean, I, I had, a, looking back, I had a really good childhood, man. I mean, my parents were, I, I could not have asked, you know, for, for better parents. Uh, we, we never, we, we certainly didn't have a lot of money, but we always had everything we needed. Uh, my dad was a, like I said, he was a blue collar worker. He, he worked for Georgia Pacific Corporation. He was, he was the uh, manager of the, what was called the cut to size uh, end of the mill where they cut boards and, and wood to size for furniture companies, you know, because North Carolina is the furniture capital of the world. Sure. And, uh, it's behind, so, chi behind China now. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, dad was over that end of it. And uh, so he worked there and uh, my mom was always a stay at home mom. She, she worked a little bit here and there, but my mom is a very unique story. She, when she was, uh, I believe she was 13. My parents grew up in a very remote area of western North Carolina up in the mountains. My mom was 13. She was shot at close range by a little boy playing with a shotgun. Uh, he was only five years old. But he knew just enough to climb up on the bed and pull it off his daddy's gun rack. And in the mountains, because they had animals, chickens and things, and if something, you know, uh, attack the chickens in the night, the farmer would get up with a shotgun and go, you know, yeah, of basically course. kill. Them. Yeah, of course. Uh, he get, so that, so the old, old farmers and the old timers, they kept guns loaded. Well, this kid knew just enough to pull the hammer back, man. And my mom was sitting on the, I, if I remember right, she was sitting on the front porch swing, maybe with her girlfriend, her girlfriend was painting her fingernails. And, uh, the little boy came through the door and he says he was trying to play cowboys and Indians, innocent five. So he says, I'm going to shoot. And and as mom jumped off the porch, man, he got her and he almost blew her in half. And oh. dude, you have to remember now, she they was just in the mountains. They had to put her on a log truck to bring her halfway out of the mountains to transfer her into a station wagon all the way to Asheville to get medical attention. Holy smokes. You got to remember there in night that was 1955, 56. So there were no cell phones. There was no, uh, nobody even had a phone down there. So, I mean, they, I, I had the doctors just said, if she lives, she'll never have kids. Wow. So been proven wrong four times over. I have two sisters and a brother. So, you know, wow. It, it, That's amazing. What a story that okay. is. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, man, because she should not have lived, but she did. And not only did she live with, she had four children and everybody's normal but me. 
<laughs> I was gonna say, any, is your uh, sisters or your brother any of them in the music business? No, no. My brother, my, my brother's a pretty strong trumpet player. He plays. Uh, he's an accountant, and he just took a job in uh, near Dallas, Texas, and he plays in the orchestra at Preston Wood Baptist Church down there. I think it is. This is a huge, huge church, and um, uh, so he plays. Uh, my sisters both used to sing at church. Uh, but uh, they don't do it so much anymore. And uh, but uh, we we always had music around the house. Uh, my dad liked to uh, play some guitar, you know, just acoustic guitar, and he only knew three chords, G, C, and D. But that was enough, that was enough to get us kick started, you know. Did you know Warren Haynes growing up? I did. You did. Did you guys play together? Oh yeah. Well, I would do jam sessions once in a while, and he you know, with Warren and, uh, yeah, I've known Warren my whole life, basically. Well, my whole life since I was a teenager Yeah. and we still, still stay in touch and he's a wonderful dude, man. He's one of those cats that in spite of all his great successes, he's just never changed. He's still that same dude, you know, uh, he's, he's a great guy and, and I'm so happy for all his success because he's, he really is a good Good guy in his heart. You know, he's he's great. Do you know he still signs autographs for hours after the show? And they're not playing twenty minute shows. They're 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 smoking one hundred and ten percent for three hours. And well, then that's he's just I mean, it's just phenomenal. Yeah, that's just Warren. That's 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 what he does. You know, I mean he's he's a boy, he's a great musician. And a lot of people don't know this. You know, he actually uh, wrote one of Garth Brooks' biggest hits. So I do know that because he recently he sold his publishing, or he got signed up with a publishing company to manage his publishing. And and I read that recently. I only found out. Yeah, he uh, he did retain all his publishing uh, for a long time. That he wrote. Um, uh, he wrote uh, two of a kind working on a full house. Right, right. That was the song. Yeah, he's prolific, that guy, man. Incredibly prolific. Yeah. Um, do you know uh, the Kentucky Headhunters? Did you grow up? Do you know those guys? Greg Martin? Uh, I, I know who they are, and we play a lot of shows with them with Artemis. Oh, do but you? I, I don't know those boys really uh, personally. Greg Martin's a wonderful guy. Very much like, a, you know, I don't know Warren Haynes, obviously, but he, I, I spent two or three hours with Greg and uh, just a very warm, very warm, genuine guy. Um, yeah, they're good guys, man. We do the, uh, every year we've done, uh, we've been asked back every year uh, to do the Rock Legends cruise with Artemis and we're going this year. The Headhunters were on with us last year and they're just, they're great, man. They're a good bunch of guys. The same old Kentucky boys yeah. that they've always, you know, they just got a little bit of money now. Yeah, so. yeah. Real cool. Um, what prompted you to move to Nashville? Playing music. Totally, just strictly, totally wanted to play my bass and make a living doing it. That, that's the only answer. I mean, you had no contacts here? You just, like, you just knew that was, you was like a calling almost? I didn't know a soul. Uh, actually, I was fortunate. Uh, Helen Cornelius, who was my first gig, she was a country star in the mid to late 70s, had a couple of hit records. Uh, Helen's husband owned a nightclub where I was playing in Greenville, South Carolina, mm -hmm. called The Silver Fox. And I played down there, and uh, she would come through occasionally and play, and and uh, I just... Uh, that year she was on tour with the Statler brothers. It was like 84, 85 or something. And, um, she, uh, hired me out of that club and that gave me my opportunity to come to Nashville and awesome. the Statler brothers, 84, 85. A lot of people don't even know who they were, but man, they were freaking dominating at that time. I mean, we were playing, you know, we were playing small arenas, you know, and, and filling them, uh, so, you know, it, it was it was uh, it was a big jump to come right out of clubs and start doing that. You know, so it was good. 
Let me ask you a question. If you were able to give your younger self advice, what would you tell yourself? Um, I would get more into songwriting and publishing earlier in my life and producing records and finding talent. Because as you get older, man, your your priorities shift. And I mean, it's really how long do you want to tour and how long do you want to be gone from your family? And the rigors of touring, even if you're on the most cush gig, is still rigorous. Sure. There's still the travel. There's still the flying. They're still getting on a bus. They're still sleeping in a bunk. There's still the daily grind of waiting all day for the gig. And I've always said, you know, I get paid for the other 23 hours out of my day that one hour that i'm playing that's what i do for free <laughs> they're paying the other they're buying the the rest of the day from me yeah know? uh and that's essentially how i've always kind of looked at it it's interesting i i have interviewed a lot of guys when they're on the road and my response always is hey listen thank you so much for taking the time i know you're on the road and again 100 percent of the time they say no thank you for helping me occupy an hour and a half <laughs> of my wasted seven to 10 hours that I've got nothing to do here. And that's exactly what everybody says. It's like, you know, if you're in New York city, maybe it's okay. You can go around, but you're not in New York city. Most of the time you're in, you know, smaller towns in the middle of or fairs and festivals and you're sort of stuck with, you know, nothing to do. So, yeah, yeah I'm not, know. yeah, I'm not the kind of guy that can sit around all day uh, I don't like to anyway. I would usually get out and find pawn shops or just walk or exercise yeah. or right. or something. Uh, be and that's why tour managing was sort of appealing to me. Yeah. That fills up part of your day. Uh, to, sometimes to to my detriment, you know. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, but, but I. I Staying busy, there's something to be said for staying busy to pass that time. Yeah, the pain of 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 having too much to do is probably less aggravating than the pain of having too little to do. Yeah, when I when I go out with the, the Box Masters, that's Billy Bob Thornton's band. When I go out with him, I tour manage and play. And uh, the last tour we did, which was April of this year, we did 31 shows in 36 days. Holy smokes! And uh, so the other days were just travel days. Uh, and it's, you know, you're looking at when you're tour managing something like that, that's a mid level. That's not a big tour. It's not a small tour. But, you know, I work, you know, 15 to 18 hours a day every day on show days. And that's 31 days of doing that. That's that's a little hard. But it's good because the tour passes quick when you do both jobs. Yeah. Because you're just slammed every minute from the time you hit the floor to the time you go to bed. You're just you're freaking busy, man. I don't know if you could answer this question. If if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what do you think you'd be doing instead, Dave? Oh, man, I'd probably do what my buddy Jerry, the guitar player in Artemis Pile Band, did. I'd probably have a music store of some kind. Uh, and I and I do have a side business now that I'd like to talk about. Yeah, yeah, let's talk the base. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about it. Definitely. I, I started doing a. I had a, a buddy of mine, Boyd Lafon, who's a wonderful bass player here in Nashville. He's he just called me up one day. I'd been working. I, I work and I still do. I still work at Corner Music in Nashville, which is a fantastic mom and pop music store. Larry Garris is the owner, and he's been a wonderful friend. He and J D Williamson is the store manager and uh, they've just been so good to me man but I've, I've, I've become uh, such a staple in the community here just because I've been here so long and I know everybody uh, and uh, they just man they just let me I've been I haven't been able to go back to work there in months but I can go back to work there tomorrow if, if, if I want and I get to pick and choose my own hours so Boyd Boyd Lafon my buddy got a hold of me and he's like hey man are you still working down at Corner Music I said well on occasion yes um, but I've been quite busy with touring this year so he says well hey man he goes I got you know I got this Ampeg SVT it's a USA model I gotta sell it it's like brand new it's one of the last USA models I made because I got this Sadowski bass I got this he had several pieces he just wanted to sell, but he goes, Dave, I don't want to put them on Craigslist. I don't want people coming to my house that I don't know. Uh, it, you know, 
He said, do you think, think you could sell them for me? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you bring them over to the house. I put them in the garage. Uh, and let me, you know, and I said, I'll, I'll sell them for you. I said, you tell me what you would like to get out of them, what you will absolutely settle for. And then, uh, you know, I'll sell them, ship them if necessary, and I'll just bring you a check. You just, you know, yeah, yeah. and I'll make a few bucks. I'll make a few bucks. You get what you need out of them. And that's how it started. So I started this business called The Base Broker. And uh, did the same thing for Cliff with ACDC. He had several bases he wanted to sell. And he just brought them and dumped them off to me. And and uh, I just started doing it. And then, you know, I had a uh, two different guys come to me that wanted to help me a little bit financially to get, get it kick-started. And that's what I'm doing now. It's thebasebroker.com. And, uh, you know, that, so I'm just doing it. It's on a very small level. It's by appointment only. I don't really have a shop that has open hours, you know, for people to just drop in. Uh, uh, you have to make appointments with me. But so far, man, I've done done okay with it. I'm, I'm pretty pretty thrilled with how it's going. That's awesome. So it's only bases for now. I try to stick, yeah, I only stick with bases because it's what I know best. And it's what I enjoy best. You know, plus if I get something really primo, I get the the the, the great option of, of buying it. it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, would would it be a situation where if someone listens to this as a guitar player and they've wanted to get involved in bass, can they you know go to the dot com and maybe email you or chat with you somehow and say, hey, do you have something? You know, I mean, like to introduce them into the bass, like what bass that might be appropriate for them based on the kind of guitar they play, what the genre of music they're looking at? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'll help in any way I'm able. I, I really do because of my clientele, I only deal in upper end stuff. I don't really have, I think the cheapest bass I have in stock right now is a, is about a thousand bucks. Um, uh, everything is pretty upper echelon, man. I have custom shop fenders, uh, I have a, a you know a Gould uh, graphite neck uh, five string, uh, which Jeff Gould was the the innovator and creator of modulus graphite, and that's his new line of bases. I have a, an NYC Sadowski five string. Most of my stuff's pretty upper end. Uh, I can get anything, uh, but I try to deal. I'm trying to keep it on the upper end of things. Uh, just because uh, there, there's just not uh, to, to be honestly uh, to be honest and truthful there's not enough profit margin in the low end stuff for a guy like me I, and I'd rather keep my quality very high so that people know when they're buying from me they they know they're getting something good and I don't have anything but five star reviews on Facebook uh, lot, lots of happy customers and that's the way we like it awesome you know? facebroker.com hey uh uh, Dave, who's the most important person in your life? Um, well, let me back up. Uh, uh, I wanted to add something. Uh, yeah, the Base please. Broker has a Facebook page, so you can just look up The Base, B-A-S-S, Broker, uh, and follow me on Facebook or message me on Facebook as well. Just so that. Great. So go to Facebook.com, The Base Broker. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, man, now to that question. Man, there's actually three. Uh, that I would have to say that are that are the most important to me, man. And and I mean, uh, you know, Jesus Christ is very relevant in my life, and probably uh, right under that would be my wife Heidi, and then our little boy Isaiah would fall right under her. But uh, I've been real blessed. Real blessed with a great family, and uh, you know that's that's where I stand. You know, how long y'all been married? Uh, only seven years, man. We met later in life, and uh, you know, and uh, we we neither one of us had a child. We wanted to to have a child. You know, we were very hopeful, but we didn't know. You know, Heidi had a. Uh, a, a bone disease in her left hip and femur and had to have total hip replacement surgery. This was way before I knew her. And uh, she's just been through so much. And she's, uh, I definitely over married. She's, uh, uh, she was a Miss Portland, Oregon. 
and uh, she won that pageant and went on to, to Miss USA and uh, she did not win there, but uh, uh, she did win Miss Portland and uh, or she didn't win Miss Oregon, I should say. Uh, but you know what, uh, Heidi is, she's the real, to tell you the truth, she's the real musician in the family. She's, uh, uh, she's a classically trained violinist, uh, plays acoustic guitar, mandolin, sings, uh, just an amazing singer, uh, songwriter, writes great songs. And she almost got a deal when Gretchen Wilson was signed, it came down to her and Gretchen at Sony, I think it was. And uh, they were hailing Heidi, my wife, as the next is the female Charlie Daniels, if you will. Wow. Because she she can play fiddle, man. She's she's she just gifted in so many areas. But she reads, you know, notation and she's the real musician of the family. If I get anything complex, like if I'm trying to learn a Dixie Dregs piece or something, I mean, I can't figure that stuff out. I have to get her out here, and she'll go, oh, well, this is what they're playing, and then she'll pick it right out and write it all out and That's awesome. teach it to me. So, uh, and, and you know I'm a secure man when I can admit that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. I always say the same thing. I'm married above my pay grade, man. I hear you on that one. So how'd you guys meet? Man, we met on – there was a there used to be a, a networking site, but I haven't been on it in forever, called uh, – Oh, geez. What was it called? It's, uh, it was for Nashville musicians. Um, oh, my gosh. The name of the site escapes me. It's where, it was basically a networking site for musicians in the Nashville area to network together. Interesting. <laughs> Nashville Music Pros. Nashville Music Pros. Yeah. That's interesting. So you met on there. Uh, I saw her on there, and we just started talking, and, you know, and then uh, that's just how we met. And then I invited her to come to church with me and we just started kind of going and sitting uh, uh, sitting together at church and that's and then beyond that I invited her over you know I always would watch football on Sundays and invite friends over and make some lunch and uh, for everybody and I just was doing that one Sunday after church and I just invited her and then she came over and we just started dating and it just kind of grew from there so here we are well, congratulations, man. I'm happy to do it. How's, how's her hip now? Is she okay? She's great, man. If you saw her, you would never know. That's good, man. I'm really happy. And I wish She's you, very That's good. I yeah. wish you guys a lot of luck, a lot of luck together, man. Thanks. Any, you have any hobbies or interests outside of music, Dave? Man, I was really into motorcycles a few years ago, but with ever the, the the texting craze and people not paying attention, which we covered <laughs> in the interview, I just and and when Isaiah was born, our little boy, you know, uh, I had a a, a a beautiful Harley Davidson that I'd actually won a couple of shows with and won some money with, and uh, sitting in my garage the last year that I owned it, I was so busy I might possibly have ridden it 30 to 50 miles that whole year oh wow and when i was wow. born uh because of the way things transpired we did not have maternity coverage so uh i sold the bike to pay for my little boy mm. and i think it was a very good mm. i think it was a very good uh, good investment yeah good investment good yeah. for you man um if you can go back maybe and do one thing differently either in business or your personal life what would that thing be? I would be more saving. What do you mean? I would be I would be more saving with money. I would be more frugal with money. I was pretty reckless when I was young, and I think that stemmed for me personally. I think that stemmed from growing up real poor, yeah. and all of a sudden having really good gigs and making. You know, I wasn't making a fortune, but I was making a very handsome living. And, and, you know, it's easy when you get in mind. And if there's one ounce of advice I would give a younger guy, that would have to be it. Is, is look, dude, <laughs> nothing lasts forever. You know, save your money, buy you a house that you can afford, build equity, and, and, and be as saving as you can. Because it's so easy, man, to be a loose cannon when you – Especially if a guy like me that grew up with nothing, well, not with nothing. I, I had a lot of things that a lot of people don't have that I grew up with that I learned that 
will go with me the rest of my life that hopefully I'll pass on to my son. Uh, but I, I don't want it to sound like we had nothing. We had my, we had the best, my, my dad did the best he could with the tools he had. So I had the things money can't buy, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. It makes a lot of sense. So I did have a lot. I don't want it to sound like we were destitute or nothing, but uh, I would say to young guys, man, be saving, be frugal, plan ahead, because all gigs end. I don't care how good they are, and unless you're in the all stones. All gigs unless you're, end. That's a, that's a – they they do, man. And unless you're Derek like Jones that. and the Stones give you a million dollars up front, you know, and even then, that's going to end. You know, but not – there's only a handful of guys that get to do this, Craig, uh, and get to do it as long as I've done it. And But there's even – I mean, you know, like the Stones gig, there's, there's only one of those. Yeah. And Daryl Jones got yeah. that pretty wrapped up for what I would say will be the rest of their career. Yeah, yeah. You're not – you're, you're probably not going to be in, in uh, Robert Trujillo's shoes and get the Metallica call and get that million <laughs> bonus check for, for being the bass player. Those gigs, just if you're lucky and you just get to play for artists and make a living, then you've got to plan just like you work on a regular job. And, but, and, and man, I'll tell you what, David Lee Roth said it best in an interview one time. He said, man, the music business, man. He said, if you can live knowing you get up in the morning that all this can be gone by lunch, he goes, you'll be fine in the music business. But if you can't live that way, you don't belong in this business. And that is when you sit and think about that for a minute, boy, he's right on. He's right on about it because, you know, I mean, heaven forbid something happens to Artemis, we won't be gigging anymore. Sure. Uh, if something, you know, if, if T Graham decides today, he just don't want to do it anymore. Then I'm, guess what? I'm off looking for another job. Sure. And at 54 years old, uh, you know, my wife and I are very fortunate. We've been blessed. Uh, we, uh, we have a beautiful home and we're debt free. And, uh, but, uh, dude, there's still car insurance, life insurance, uh, we try to eat very good quality of food, and so buying mm-hmm. organic food is quite expensive. Oh, yeah. And the power bill, the water bill, uh, you know, baby needs shoes. Uh, <laughs> I, hear, I, I got three, yeah. man. Believe me, I'm, on, I'm at the tail end of that. I'm at the 10-yard line. I got a 17-year-old left at home, and that's it. We made it. Right. Good. Good for you. But y- you know what it's like, man. Absolutely. You, you still yeah. gotta pay, you still got to pay all this stuff. And by the time you do all that, you know, life insurance and all your stuff, you know, we're still staring, you know, needing and, and need to, and my little boys in private school. We, we've been very fortunate. And and so between all that stuff, man, you know, you're still staring down three grand a month. you got to make yeah, at least. Yeah. So, you know. And that's uh, net. So just, that's net. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, you know. Just be saving. I, uh, you know, if there's one thing I wish I would have done more of is, I would. I wish I would have planned a little better. We're we're okay. Again, I don't want to sound like we're destitute, but, um, but yeah, I would I would have probably planned better financially. You know, though, Dave, I think, <laughs> I think that is a skill, and unless you somehow caught wind of it and studied it on your own. Or unless you happen to grow up with somebody that shared this knowledge with you, that's a skill set that you, it's like playing music, right? You, in this case, you went off and pursued it on your own, but it, it, it is a skill, a learned skill, you know? And so you got to either be lucky enough to, for some reason, have it in your head and learn or have most of the time people share with you. And if you didn't have that, it's a tougher thing to do, I think. You know, it's not uh, natural. Yeah, if you aren't caught somewhere along the way, like I said, my dad was a blue collar worker. We were just paycheck to paycheck. Sure. And it sounds like you you probably were too. Oh, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And our parents just, you know, they just figured it out as it came up, just just like I've had to do. Sure. But I, I I'm I'm hopeful as we all are hopeful 
that our kids do better than us. Oh, of course. You know? and, and I hope I can instill that in my little boy and, and teach him the things that my parents so not that they didn't want to, it's just they didn't know how to. No, they didn't have the skill. They didn't have the knowledge base. Yeah, yeah, totally. Hey, I'm going to ask you two more questions, and I really appreciate your time and, and your candor and, and transparency. What's the best advice you've ever been given, and who gave it to you? Hmm. Oh, my gosh. Man, you know, probably my mom, just because she's lived she's lived through so much uh just probably uh, there's a lot that comes from moms and dads as you know but just trying to be morally uh for for her to to, to try to teach me and show me and 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 the advice as well of, of being a morally good person and uh, pursuing all that's right, and, uh, and and always, always without fail, trying to do the right thing. I just don't think there's anything more important than that in, in, in life. Um, and, and that's 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 just been my that's both for my mom and dad, but probably I, I would have to say that would be. You know, if, if you could consider that advice, you know. Yeah, for sure, man. I once heard a definition of, uh, 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 like, honesty or something is like doing the right thing when no one's looking. And I always thought that was a good, you know. Yeah, I thought yeah, that, that was pretty good. Uh, and it's also very true. Oh, hell yeah. Last question, man. If you thought the last question was tough, too, this one is really hard. What's your definition of happiness right now? Because that does change. <laughs> Man, happiness is is contentment with where you are. To me, it would be, you know, there's so much going on in our world right now. It, 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 you know, as we have already spoke about too. It's uh, before we started the interview. You know, I visited about that a little bit. There's just so much going on right now, and man, being content in your soul and knowing that you're. Uh, you know, if it all ends tomorrow, that you're you're uh, striving to go to a better place, you know, and and through me that that stems through my 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 faith and 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 of course Christianity, you know. Uh, there's you just can't, Craig. You know, man, you can't buy contentment. You can't. No. It, it's not for sale. It, it's uh, it's a it's a peaceful. Is that is well, for lack of a better way to put it, the Eagles, the old those great philosophers, the Eagles, that peaceful, <laughs> easy. Yeah, man. You know, yeah. There's I mean, a lot to be money, said about that. Yeah, absolutely. It really and, is. and it's there's just there's a lot. You, you know, just being content to me is is happiness, and being where I am, I have a a wife that loves me, and I have a little boy that's just amazing, and. Uh, we still have uh, Heidi's dad lives with us. He's 84, but he's in great health. Uh, he goes to the Y almost every day, and he's done so much for us. Uh, he's really helped us financially, and and it's just been, you know, it's just been amazing. You know, I mean, I don't have, I I could I could sit here and and bitch all day about something, but why? You yeah. know, I mean, I, I have food to eat. My little boy won't go hungry today. He's in a great private school. Uh, the grass is green. The wind's blowing. The sun's out. I'm getting to talk to you about something I love to do. I mean, life is good, man. Man, I'm really happy for you that you are in such a good place. And you're an understated guy because you're a lot more... Um, successful and your career has been very robust and you're very understated about it and i really enjoyed talking to you man i appreciate uh your transparency you're just a really good guy and, and uh, i enjoy that so thank you as far as people finding you online davefowler.com facebook.com forward slash dave f on base and your businesses 
the base broker, T H E B A S S B R O K E R dot com and Facebook dot com forward slash the base broker. Did I miss right. anything? No, I, I did just so that everybody knows in case I don't respond. I did deactivate my main personal Facebook page. Um, but you can still find my music page, the bass broker page. It's all still there. It's just uh, as passionate as I get about my beliefs and my politics and everything, I just got to have a break from it. (laughs) (laughs) So I, 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 I hired a marketing person to kind of oversee that for a while. And I told her, she's like, well, let's deactivate it and, and just concentrate. I I really want to boost more of my music page anyway. And my, keep my tour schedule up because I love seeing, you know, I've, like I said, I've been blessed to tour so many years. I can hardly go to any city in the U S and oftentimes Europe where I don't have friends from years of tour. So I love to, to always try to put the tour dates out there in case, Somebody I haven't an old friend I haven't seen in a long time wants to come out and hang. You know we can do that. And uh, so if you can't reach me through there, by all means try the music page. It's very uh, uh, easy way to get a hold of me. And again, that's Facebook.com forward slash Dave F on base B A S S. All right, man. Mm-hmm. Any last any parting words? No, man. I just. You know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today. I appreciate you taking your time to to talk to me. And, uh, um, you know, if I if anybody's out there that I can be a help to in any manner, you know, just reach out to me. My email is Dave at Dave Fowler dot com. And I answer everything that comes through, man. You know, I keep my mailbox cleaned out daily. So chances are pretty good. I'll get to you within 24 hours of getting your email. So if I can be a help to anybody, you know, by all means, um, just reach out to me. Yeah. He's, t- he's telling you the truth. He's like really on top of his emails, man. <laughs> I can tell you from experience, you're awesome. You're really easy to deal with. No, the pleasure is mine, man. Thank you very much for your time. Um, everybody, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview. I hope you enjoyed getting to know Dave Fowler as much as I did. Dave, once again, thank you so much for your time. Everybody, go to uh, everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified about future episodes, along with some other cool new things we'll be doing for guitar players. Now, be nice, everybody. Go play your guitar and have some fun. Until next time, I'm out. Peace, y'all. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.